but you know, we're, we're here to, to talk about the last podcast. It is, you know, I guess, firstly, congratulations on it being selected for Fright Fest and it's 25th banner year. You know, it's a big anniversary. How are you? How are you feeling about the screening? Uh, I'm very excited about the screening. Uh, initially, we had thought about taking the film and and looking at it as, as something that we would release through um, or submit to other festivals that are the conventional festivals. And, and, and the thing about horror is that um, the caliber of films and festivals is, is on level with any other festival that's out there, especially some of these festivals and, and Fright Fest being one of those. Um, I'm a uh, total uh, English file. Um, and so for me to have a world premiere in England is just pretty, pretty epic. The festival is fantastic. Um, it's been around, as you said, for a quarter of a century. That's a big milestone. Um, so to, to be a part of it at that moment, that anniversary is, yeah, I couldn't ask for a, a better debut for a film. And for people that haven't read up on, on the last podcast yet, how would, how would you describe it? How have you been you know, selling it to people? Sure. Uh, the last podcast is basically about Charlie Bailey, who is a extremely ambitious young podcaster uh, who decided to have his angle be to stand out from the 5 million other podcast hosts that are out there in the world um, to debunk the supernatural. So he's a debunker uh, in a space that uh, there's not many of those. And so his little hook is that he does it in a very pernicious way, um, very mean spirited. And his girlfriend doesn't really think that 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 is healthy or good or just nice, but he leans into it pretty heavily. And so what happens is he gets a, a, a text, an Instagram message from an associate professor who claims that he can scientifically prove that there is no afterlife. So he races out one night. And, and his uh, experiment goes a little awry. And what happens then um, turns Charlie's life and career upside down. And so it's it's got a lot of themes going. One of the, 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 the influences of this movie is An American Werewolf in London, um, which is one of my favorite buddy buddy movies. That's how I look at it. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it's tough because I don't want to give you know, uh, any spoilers, but um, there's, um, you know, he, it ends up becoming this, this relationship that um, has as many twists and turns as the movie does. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to describe it. I think something that I've noticed a lot over, over recent years, you know, once upon a time, leads in, in films, particularly horror, they were, they were writers, they were authors, and now there just seem to be this shift into podcasters and influences why do you what do you think that that's changed and and what do you think that 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 brings this this new you know these new conduits for these stories well i think the best way to um well let me just say that the way this film came about is an ex is directly related to that question i had made this film called the mcpherson tape many years ago and the film became something of a cult uh, hit and I was invited to come to not only um, festivals that are genre festivals and um, like Sieges and, and Fantastic Fest, but also to UFO film festivals. Um, because for a five year period, and actually still to this day, some people believe the movie is actually real. It was one of the first found footage films made in the 80s. And so I would do these podcasts where I would debunk my own. <laughs> my own movie. And so um, one of the guys who has this UFO podcast, he, he had to have heart surgery and he asked me to fill in. So for over a month, I was a podcast host. And, and so the attraction for that was I could get together with someone and, and talk with them in depth and we could really go into the rabbit hole of whatever subject we were talking about. Um, but what people don't know is that there's a lot of work that goes into doing a podcast. You've got to promote the hell out of it, constantly get eyeballs out there, constantly nudging people along and trying to get the sacred 100K, all these milestones, 100K subscribers, and I got to get a million, et cetera. 
And so at the end of my little stint as a podcaster, I was encouraged by some of the listeners to create my own podcast. So I went down that rabbit hole. Uh, six months later, uh, my girlfriend looks over at me, sees me at my desk and says, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm doing research for my podcast. I, I, I've got to make sure that I get a, you know, I, I come out of the gate firing all pistons, this and that. And she says, uh, no, why are you doing this? And I said, well, because it's going to be fun. This is going to be a fun thing that I'm going to do. And she goes, I've been watching you. It doesn't look very fun. And at that moment, I realized, yeah, I'm doing this for all the wrong reasons. And so I quit cold turkey. And then um, I knew that the director strike was coming up. I'm a guild member. And I had been making these documentaries and had made a, a film in a few years. And I thought, I have to get back to it. What am I going to write about? And that was right there, um, right? You know, this character and, and going through this whole thing. And so I think um, it, it was really, I think why people gravitate towards this is everyone has an opinion and everyone's got their own take. And what we've learned on social media is that there's a lot of funny people out there. I'm always surprised when I see posts and stuff, how eloquent people are, insightful, are just funny as shit. I can cuss, right? right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that um, I think that is very attractive to be able to to connect with people in a way, especially when we went through the pandemic. Um, there was a lot of podcast hosts that came out of that. So I think it's it's really, sorry, this is a long answer. Um, I think it's really um, a, a way to, to communicate a love of something and to share that love. And I think when it's done in that spirit, that's when podcasts are at their best. Yeah, no, I agree. And the film, as that I really enjoyed about it is it does a really good job um, at juggling the humor and the pathos, which I guess if, uh, you know, American Werewolf is one of your favorite films that kind of makes sense now because that film goes from being, you know, the moments of humor to, you know, it's quite sad what's happening to David, you know, and it's kind of, I think, mirrored in in a respect with with charlie in the last podcast how did you go about you know making sure that that balance was there and that you didn't veer too far into into one side over the other i'm a card carrying smart ass so every single project i ever do i have um i have levity and so for me <clears throat> whether i'm doing a western or um, a drama thriller it's going to have that that component in it but one of the things that that felt like this was a, a nice marriage, and it always is, and I'm surprised that there's not more of it, is comedy and, and horror sit side by side, as far as, as we know, the reactive aspect of it, where you react physically more than any other um, genre uh, type of film. And so I, I felt like, well, I wanted to do both. I want to be able to scare and amuse at the same time. And then also what's great about that is at some point you're not sure in certain areas if you should in that moment be laughing or be scared. And then you realize, oh, it's okay to do this. And so, you know, a great example of that is, is and this is much more uh, irony, but uh, get out. I mean, that had humor in it, <clears throat> but also had a lot of irony <clears throat> more than anything. And so, um, and satire. So this was, yeah, this this felt like it it was a perfect fit for that, um, for that tone and to keep it going throughout. It felt like they both complemented each other. Also, my lead actor Eric is just a powerhouse, and I uh, I don't know that anyone, any actor that I'm aware of right now that that is you know in his age range and everything, could have brought it like he did because of his own personal background in the social media uh, space. Yeah, he's 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 a great player. He's again, he's very much in you know almost every scene. You know, it's very much a film about about him and his journey. And he is this character that has several sides to him. You know, he has his podcast persona, which very much is a, a podcast persona. And then there's this other side to him, and he's he's very high energy. And then he's placed alongside this other character who is you know effectively mute. Um, you know, what was it about, you know, Eric and, and Gabriel that, that worked so well for you? Because I guess you're not 
necessarily casting one you're casting the pair of them because you need the two of them to be able to carry off the the, the second half of the film right uh eric brought gabriel rush uh onto our radar uh gabriel had done a couple of wes anderson films um he did the grand budapest hotel and uh, uh moonlight i forgot the name of that one was um which was i think the one before um and uh, gabriel was a dancer and had done Broadway. She was Billy Elliot uh, on Broadway. And there was a sense of movement about him, the way that he moved. I'm a huge, huge fan of, of um, the silent movie era acting. And so for me to have a character that literally is a silent actor and how he's gonna convey everything with a look, that, that was a great challenge. And I thought that would be a great dynamic juxtapose against Eric, uh, Charlie, the character Charlie's uh, manic energy. And so it seemed like he was this calming force. In fact, we had even more fun with it. We went to mix the film um, a few weeks ago. Um, the, uh, the the mixer, Chris Basta, um, he, he, it was a real collaboration where it was, what if we take out every single um, foley or noise rustling of his clothes and stuff. Uh, so every time Duncan moves, sits down, gets up, walks, we don't hear anything. And that is right next to <laughs> Eric. And it's subconscious. You don't, you don't get it. Eric, who is, um, you know, who's, who's very big and sometimes bombastic and moving around and everything like a bull in a china shop. And here's this kind of uh, lithy, ghostly thing, just kind of, you know, um, ethereally going through that but you you feel it and so it was an opportunity to to really lean into that those two opposite dynamics yeah so i think it i think it works really well i mean you mentioned you know you mentioned earlier that you know you you know sort of known to a lot of people for making them a first and tape which is you know was viewed as by a lot of people as one of the originators of of found footage um as as an originator how have you have you found the journey that that subgenre has gone on because it's you know it's, it's very different from from where we started yeah it is um first the context uh of that movie was when i made it was 1988 i had the idea to do this film i only had 6500 bucks to my name there was no found footage market um it did not exist um so we shot this thing in one night. It was all improvised and then went out to sell it. And an example of how this was um, unknown and unappreciated the genre was that I had distributors get really pissed off at me and yell at me to get out of their office when I'd show them my little teaser because they didn't appreciate it and, and get it. And so when Blair Witch came out, Blair Witch came out a year after I had remade the McPherson tape for uh, UPN as a TV movie. And so in fact, when I made that uh, and I was up shooting it in Vancouver, uh, which was called Alien Abduction in St. Lake County, everyone at UPN got fired. Uh, forgive me if, if you've heard all this before. Everyone at UPN gets fired. I come back and they look at us like we're just complete jackasses. Really, they're like, you, you made a movie shot on digital, what's digital? You did 20 minute takes with no name actors. What, what the hell is wrong with you? Thank God we're here to save the network. And so they cut it down to an hour and they aired it and it got them the highest ratings for a prime time Tuesday night slot. And so they put more footage in and then it did even better. And then the head of the network, his name is Dean Valentine. I have no problem outing him. He said that, sh that effing show will never be on our network again. This is what I was told by the head of TV movie department. And so then flash forward a year later, Blair Witch comes out and now they're going, okay, well maybe they were onto something. When I saw Blair Witch, my first reaction was, damn, I, I maybe should have submitted my film to Sundance, but it wasn't the time at all. I mean, a decade before, it's, it's good to be early and be the first or one of the first, but it's not a decade <laughs> early. That's not good. So I feel like where it's gone has, um, been much more inventive. I love it when it's not just a horror film, when it's in some other genre as well. Um, I've actually made two, or I, I made another 
found footage film, which has to do with politics, um, that I'll never see the light of day because of something that happened. Um, so I guess that's just a mean tease of me. Um, but I've, I've, I felt like, um, you know, when, when you give to something or you see something develop, you have ideas as well as what could be done next with it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I, and I have considered going back in that space and doing something, um, even a remake, a third remake, a trilogy of the McPherson tape. So we'll see. It almost happened at Paramount, um, but studio, so we'll see. So, and I have to say, as somebody that grew up with just an absolute phobia of, of extraterrestrials, I'm very glad that I waited until I knew about you know what found footage was before I watched it, because otherwise I would have been one of those people that was like, no, this is real, like, and just I would have <laughs> never slept again. So I'm, I'm quite happy that you know found footage took off and you know was a, was a good okay this is this is like this is pretend because yeah otherwise I would have just been just anxiety I think <laughs> yeah and part of me feels really bad and another part of me feels like yeah good it's you know, that's the reaction <laughs> yeah yeah I mean even knowing it was found footage that as a, that has that weird innate fear which is crazy because like aliens uh, you know xenomorph you know that alien i'm absolutely fine with but the the creatures in the mcpherson tape very much are not like the ones obviously they're always on the the ufo programs and stuff they just terrify me so even knowing it was found footage there were still moments where it's like i don't like this because this that is what scares me we might have to put you under regressive hypnosis and see if there's something there <laughs> i remember once i um I, two nights in a row I had I woke up with a nosebleed at, at like about 3 30 in the morning and my mum was like aliens and it's like great thanks mum that's what great, I want to hear sleep now I'll never yeah. sleep thanks mum yeah that, that'll, that'll help it start but yeah I think I've just I was just I was of the the generation that watched the x-files far too young and yeah it just it seeped in but um, back to back to you know the last last podcast. As we said, it's screening at, at Fright Fest, and um, Fright Festers are you know very diligently working out what they're going to watch and when. Why do you hope that they take a chance on on your film? Why audiences uh, take a chance on it? Yeah, why do you hope that like the Fright Fest audience sort of take a chance on on this one and add it to the to their schedule? Um, I believe what they liked about it was it definitely has it ticks the box with regards to horror and some of the way that we do some of the horror which is uh uh seems to be original but it's the character i think it's the the humor um the journey that this character goes on uh it seems more relevant now with social media addiction um and this film ultimately is about addiction and so i i i'm hoping that the audience will connect on that um, I feel like um, Paul, the um, the uh, festival director, was very excited about that this was something that was going to be that was that was not going to be exactly like every single thing that that they have there. That this would be an opportunity to do something um, that's still on that space, but outside and fun, original. And so um, I think you know. So, so my goals for the film is that, you know, people enjoy it and they take it in and then they forget what genre it's in and they're just watching this character go through this crazy ass shit. And are you ready to, you know, appear on like several, several hundred podcasts talking about the last podcast? <laughs> yes, I think I am going to have to uh, um, represent from one podcaster to another. Uh, yes, yes, I am. I am prepared. I've got my nice microphone here i spent more than uh 50 bucks on so <laughs> well i wish you best of luck with the screening at fright fest thank you very much i appreciate it